Let us worship God. We gather together this morning to draw nigh to the Lord and to lift up our praise to him. This is the Christian Sabbath, a day set apart uh, in which we seek uh, the Lord's face and delight in our fellowship with him. And of course, in our congregation, this is also a sacrament Sabbath in which we celebrate the ordinance of uh, the Lord's Supper. And so two things are taking place this morning. Unlike the superstitions of the world, uh, we have divine ordinances. Uh, the Sabbath is a day in which we remember his resurrection uh, each week. And the Lord's Supper is an ordinance in which we remember his death uh, on behalf of his people. And so with these things in mind, let us turn then to the worship of God and we'll sing together from Psalm 103. We'll sing verses 1 to 5. If you have one of the red psalters with the music at the top, you'll find the tune on page 82, which is called London New. Psalm 103. You remember the Lord's words with regards to the supper. He says, do this in remembrance of me. We're remembering something, among other things. And here in this psalm, uh, we see in verse 2, we sing, bless, O my soul, the Lord thy God, and not forgetful be. In other words, be reminded, remember, of all his gracious benefits he hath bestowed on thee. And then we sing about some of those benefits in verses 3 to 5. So let's sing together Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. together for prayer. O 
our great and merciful God in heaven. How thankful we are that you are the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, and that we can gather this day under the shadow of your wing. We come, O Lord, rejoicing that you are the God who has freed captives, that you are the God who has given sight to the blind, that you are the God who is pleased to raise up those who are brought low, and that in all of these things you have pity for needy sinners. And so, Lord, we delight in the privileges given, afforded to us to come into your presence and to worship you, the great God of all the earth, and to ascribe unto you these praises that we have raised, calling our own souls to account, being reminded of the gracious benefits that have been bestowed upon us as a sinful people, thankful that we are found accepted in the Beloved. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you who, in whom is found all fullness would meet us in all of our emptiness, that though we are weak, we would know something of your strength and divine power. We come, O oh Lord, asking that you would expose the sins that are within our hearts, that you would search us out, and that you would grant us uh, the fresh contrition for sin. We must repent even of our repentances. We must, O Lord, acknowledge that in our holy service we have been unholy. We confess the sin of communions which have passed unimproved in days gone by. Confess that we have a lack of faith and love and earnestness uh, toward you, and that we stand in dependence asking that you would warm uh, our cold hearts and that you would uh, revive the work which you have set about to do in the souls of, of your people. And so we come pleading, O Lord, that you would have mercy upon us, that you would cleanse, as it were, our leprous souls, that you would take that uh, greatness of our sin and cover it with the blanket of Christ's righteousness, even as the fresh uh, snow covers with whiteness uh, a muddy ground. We come asking that Christ crucified would be esteemed in our eyes, that we would behold this incredible spectacle which stands at the very pinnacle of history, in which the Son of God, who was the incarnate Word, offered himself as a sacrifice for sin on behalf of his people in order to make atonement, in order to expiate and propitiate, in order to bear away their sins in his own body, uh, to shed precious blood that might be applied, sprinkled upon guilty consciences, cleansing sinners from the defilement of all of our iniquities. We rejoice, O oh Lord, in this good news. We are thankful that there is a gospel that has been left in this world, a word to be proclaimed within our ears. We are thankful that, that this uh, blessed evangel sets forth uh, the holy mysteries of, of you, our God in heaven, and that we can see righteousness and mercy kiss we can see a holy God reconciled to unholy people. Uh, we can see those who were in the dungeon of sin brought into the heights of heaven. And we, O oh Lord, are made glad. And we pray that you would cause us to taste and see that you are gracious this day. And that we would rejoice in the bounty provided for us. And we thank you, O oh God, for this feast, a banquet set aside for Weary pilgrims in which we find nourishment and our souls are uh, given uh, fresh grace and strength. Uh, we are grateful, O oh Lord, that we are not left weary, that we are not left, as it were, despondent, that we are uh, not left uh, to, to beg uh, from others, but that you invite us to come and to sup with you. 
And we ask that you would cause your blessing to abound toward us and all that we are about, that we would be, as we heard last evening, enabled in faith to wrestle and lay hold of Christ and to do so with a holy resolution, unwilling to leave without the blessing. We ask that you would impart such uh, to our souls and bless our children that we are thankful that as with our Old Testament fathers, the children were invited uh, to watch and they were even encouraged to ask, what mean ye by this service? And so too may it be this morning that our children would uh, look upon uh, all that is unfolding, the words spoken, the actions that are engaged in, all that is symbolized and more importantly, uh, what is signified in it. And may their own uh, hearts be drawn out uh, to love the Lord Jesus Christ. May they be, as it were, running even from their seats to find refuge in him, to plead the application of his blood. And may they uh, hunger with great spiritual pain uh, for the feast of your grace that is to be found in your gospel. We ask that you would bless us in all that we're about. And we do so, O Lord, in anticipation of uh, the great wedding reception, the marriage of the Lamb, and the marriage supper of the Lamb on the last day. And we look, O Lord, with uh, great anticipation and joy uh, to that day. And so we are led to think upon our brothers and sisters throughout the whole world, others gathered in this city and state and country, those gathered uh, far away from us, uh, in distant places on this earth, and yet nevertheless uh, united with us, fellow members together of one body of which Christ alone is head. And we ask that you would give blessing uh, to these as well, that your church as it is gathered uh, everywhere uh, this day. And as, as the word of Christ is preached and set forth, uh, grant that you would cause it to come with power, to the conversion of sinners and to the sanctification and building up of your people unto holiness. Uh, grant, O oh Lord, uh, a great uh, ingathering on this market day of the soul, uh, that there might be uh, many, many who are given cause to rejoice and mark these days as days in which God came down and brought uh, his own efficacious word uh, to bear upon the soul. And so we pray for the cause of Christ throughout the whole earth, asking, O Lord, that the gospel would be preached to every creature under heaven, that the word of God would be translated into every tongue, uh, that churches would be planted and ministers would be commissioned to labor in every corner of this globe, and that the light would indeed shine in all of its blinding brilliance, and would be a light to the path, a lamp before the feet of the sons and daughters of men, guiding them into the narrow path through the straight gate, which leads ultimately to heaven itself. And so, Lord, add your, uh, grant your help in all, of these, uh, in all of these things. Look upon those who mourn this day and grant that they might be comforted. Look upon those who struggle with despondency and fears, those whose assurance, assurance wanes, and grant them a fresh persuasion of divine love and pour into their hearts uh, a conscious sense of, of your grace. And we plead, O Lord, that you would break the impenitent, that you would not leave them, which would be a severe judgment, not leave them to themselves, but quicken them and liven them and awaken them and recover them that they might be brought by way of faith and repentance to the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we, O Lord, uh, go from this place with the testimony that we have met with God, that God is of a truth among us, and that even others would be able to observe this testimony that surely they have been with Jesus. Uh, may it be true of us. We look, O Lord, to you and to you alone for blessing and all that we're about. And we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
sing together from Psalm 22. And for those who haven't been with us, we, we reserve our second and third singings to singing through the, the Psalms sequentially, and we've done this many, many, many times now, having gone through the book of Psalms. And so we, we find ourselves in God's providence this morning at verse 22, Psalm 22, verse 22, and we'll sing through verse 26. The tune is Arden, which is tune number 21. And note especially verse 26 in light of one of the reasons for which we're gathered this day. The meek shall eat and shall be filled. They also praise shall give unto the Lord that do him seek. Your heart shall ever live. This is a promise which we receive and believe, cast our hope upon. We shall indeed eat and be filled. Let's sing together Psalm 22, verses 22 to 26. First reading, our Old Testament reading, is found in the book of Leviticus, and we'll be reading together from Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. This is the third book of the Bible. We'll read together the whole chapter, beginning at verse 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of, of the Lord. Blood shall be imputed unto that man, for he hath shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and, and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof, Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. Then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Amen. Let's continue to seek the, the face of the Lord in worship, uh, lifting up not only our, our mouths to him, but also our hearts in the singing of his praise. We turn back to Psalm 22 where we left off a moment ago, and we'll sing the remainder of the psalm, beginning at verse 27, singing through to the end at verse 31. Psalm 22, beginning at verse 27, and the tune is Pretorius, which is tune number 101. Tune 101. Notice again the repetition of what I mentioned in the previous portion, in verse 29. Earth's fat ones eat, and worship shall. All who to dust descend shall bow to him. None of them can his soul from death defend. Let's sing together verses 27 to the end.
reading from the New Testament scriptures is found toward the end of the Bible in the book of 1 John. We'll be reading chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. This is the portion of God's word from which we will take our text in verse 7. First John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen, and may God bless the reading of his holy word. This morning I would direct your attention to uh, that chapter that we just read together, and specifically to verse 7. Our text is 1 John chapter 1, and we'll be considering the, the second half of verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, And then these words will be our focus. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Everyone here this morning has had an experience where there's a big family festival that's taking place. And a day is appointed and a special meal is prepared And people begin to look forward to this this feast. What is the most common question that children are apt to ask as they look forward to that day? Well, maybe my house is unique, but I doubt it. My guess is that in your home, it's much like mine. And by far and away, the most common question, often repeated after answered, Uh, over and over, what is it that we are going to eat? What shall we eat? What is it that's being prepared? What will be on the table? What are all the details? Who's making what? What dishes? What flavors? What aromas? What scrumptious tastes will we be able to enjoy? Food is the heart of a feast. It's the source of delight for most of us. It's what we anticipate, it's what we have hunger pains for, and it's ultimately what satisfies all of those cravings. This morning we're gathered together in the public worship of God to celebrate his ordinances, and among the others, the Lord has appointed this day for us in our congregation in which we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it ought to be the prevailing question in all of our hearts and minds this morning. 
What shall we eat? What is it, the aroma and the taste that the Lord has provided for our souls to feast upon? The Lord gives us all of that, descriptions of that in his word. And so we're focusing this morning on the death of Christ in connection with the the Lord's Supper, which is signified and sealed to us uh, in that ordinance. But I want you to note here in 1 John the context in which verse 7 comes to us. The context is explicitly that of fellowship. He speaks in verse 3 and again in verse 6, the verse immediately prior to ours, of fellowship with God. The word there can be translated fellowship or communion. It's talking about fellowship, communion with God. And the context is fellowship or communion with one another. Again, verse 3 and then our, our, the first part of verse 7, fellowship with one another. There is a vertical communion and there is an horizontal communion. And it is one of the priceless privileges of being a Christian We walk all our days in fellowship with the triune God and consequently in fellowship with one another. This is our life. And it's in that context that he then, the Lord, directs our attention specifically to the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, which cleanseth us from all sin. So I want us to look at two things this morning. First of all, Christ's blood And then secondly, cleansing blood. First of all, Christ's blood. Now you know that Christ's entire life was a continual act of obedience. His entire life was devoted to to suffering. All of it. It was one long protracted period of suffering for him. But the height of his obedience and the culmination of his suffering is depicted in the shedding of his blood upon the cross of Calvary. And this is what's being referenced. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, which cleanseth us from all sin. Think with me about this. It speaks of the blood and the blood, the text says. Now this reverses what we would normally think of. Blood normally stains. We try to keep blood off of things. We wipe it away. We dab it up. As soon as it touches a cloth, we we seek to immediately uh, try to erase its mark from that cloth. But here the passage is telling us that while blood normally can't cleanse but rather stain, this blood does the reverse. This blood has the power to extract the stains of sin from the souls of of sinners. This blood is of great importance. If you go back to Numbers uh, chapter, in the Old Testament, chapter 35, verse 33, it says, So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for the blood it defileth the land. This is the shedding of innocent blood. It stains, it defiles. For the blood, it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. He's saying, how do we remove this curse of blood that has been shed? Only by the shedding of the blood of the one who brought about this great crime. And so we see that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he comes and stands in the place of his people and sheds his blood in the place of their blood in order to remove the curse and guilt guilt of all of the sins, crimes that we have committed against him. Speaking of the sacrifice of Christ, we read in our Old Testament reading from Leviticus 7 that life is in the blood. Christ has been sacrificed. This is blood that is sacred to God. And it is blood that unfolds the character of God. It is blood that manifests the the glory of God and fills the entire world with his glory. The Old Testament saint 
had this pressed upon their hearts and minds because they would come to the tabernacle. They would come to the temple. They would stand before an army of priests and altars and sacrifices. And they would be overwhelmed by it. There was, there was blood on the altar. There was blood down the sides of the altar. There was blood that was caught into bowls, giant bowls full of blood. There was blood flowing all around the altar. There was blood that was seen sprinkled upon their own bodies and upon others who were standing around them. There was blood everywhere. And it was shouting to them, in the words of the Old Testament, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, no forgiveness, no pardon without the shedding of of blood. It is impossible for us to view this blood too highly. We can think of ourselves too highly. We can think of our graces too highly. There are many things that we can esteem too highly, but never the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only remedy for our depravity. We have leprosy within us. We have a plague without us. And the Lord says, it is blood that will purge you. But notice it's not just blood. It's described as, and the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus means God saved. Christ means the anointed one. He is the the prophet, priest, and king of God's people. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. It's interesting because the Greek word take away means both to take up as well as to take away. He takes it up and he bears it or carries it away because he's the one and only mediator between God and man. He is the Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know this morning nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ if you do not know this. You may have read in the the annals of secular history about a historic figure who had some significance, who walked the earth in ancient days, who was called Jesus the Christ. But you know nothing of him truly unless you are intimately acquainted with the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. This was, my friends, sinless humanity. This was sinless humanity. The arteries of the man Jesus Christ, were untainted by sin. There was no sin to be found within him, no guile in his mouth. He was full of grace and truth from the very conception. The Holy Spirit referred to him as that holy thing. He was sinless. And therefore, as he was offering himself, paying the penalty for sin on behalf of his people. It was a holy sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be without blemish. It had to be perfect, without deformity, nothing wrong with it. And it was a a figure, albeit an inadequate figure, pointing forward to the sinless, holy one who would be truly and it would embody perfection himself. Here we see the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ passing before our mind's eye. This is precious to the Christian because as we reflect upon the word of God, Christ crucified, set forth before us, it was no stranger that hung there, Christian. It was your elder brother. It was your beloved, your friend, your heavenly husband who hung upon that cross. If the the blood shed by a son, the blood shed by a husband, blood shed by a father would be counted precious to anyone who still has sanity, how much more the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This has a voice. This blood has a power, even in heaven itself. In the words of Hebrews, it speaks, and it speaks things better than the things of Abel. It has a voice in heaven. But notice that the text goes on. The blood 
of Jesus Christ, two words, his son. The blood of Jesus Christ, the Father's son, God's own son. It is his sonship that makes this blood so valuable. There is a divine merit. There is a divine value in the blood of his son. This is not the son of Mary being referred to, but the son of God. The son of God, the second person of the Godhead, incarnate, came into this world, made flesh, fully God and fully man. This is the son of the father. And it is precious, acceptable, because it is the Son's blood, acceptable to the law giver on behalf of the law breakers. There is a covenant that stands behind this, a covenant between the Father and the Son from eternity past, in which there was an engagement, the Father sending the Son, the Son being sent by the Father, the Father sending in love, the Son going in love, that in concert together they might redeem a people that there might be a bride presented, a people, children of the living God. And so it is because of that covenant that the Bible can refer to Jesus as one who was slain before the foundation of the world, though brought to pass in time. Here in Christ, the Son of God, we see righteousness and mercy kissing, We see the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, harmonizing all of God's attributes. His holiness is seen in the shedding of his blood. And his love is seen in the shedding of his blood. The righteous sentence of God is seen in the the blood of his son. And the mercy of God is seen there. These things are mingled together. They are mingled together. It is the blood of Jehovah Jesus. And one drop shed would have been sufficient because of it being the blood of his son to have canceled and removed and purged every sin of every one of his elect people. Those words, his son, should underline in your mind that this blood is not only precious to you, Christian, but this blood is precious to the Father. It is the blood of his own son, I would put to you that the father never loved his son more than he did then. As he shed his blood upon the cross on behalf of his people. God gazed upon this amazing spectacle and he accepted it. It was caught, as it were, in the great bowl of God. In order that it might be applied by God to his people. Well, if it is precious to the Father, if it is acceptable to the Father, how much more should it be precious to us? How much more should we find it acceptable indeed? We ought to come believing with simplicity and fervency that the blood of Christ is able to cleanse us from all of our sin. The blood of his Son reveals how precious it is. It also not only reveals how precious It is to the Father. The blood is to the Father. It reveals how precious you are to the Father. Because he was willing to send his son and sacrifice his son. Why? In order to deliver you from that sentence yourself. Christ would bear the wrath of the Father as the substitute of every Christian in order that you might not have to bear a single drop of it. Do you see how precious your soul is? You think to yourself, well, I'm struggling and I'm, you know, I see my sin, my guilt, my past, my present. I see all of these things and they beat upon me, blow after blow and unsettle me. And the Lord comes and says, it's the blood of my son that demonstrates how precious your soul, Christian, is to me. I have purchased you at the highest possible price. It shows how precious your prayers are because they're sprinkled. They come through the intercessions of the Lord Jesus. It shows how precious your service 
in whatever arena the Lord has called you is to him. All of it, your life, your prayers, your actions and service, it rises like tremendous clouds of fragrance acceptable before the Father. It is the blood of his Son that, by which we have peace with God. There is a refuge for our conscience. And because of this peace that we have with God, we do have a refuge to run to. But it's only there because while we enjoy peace, Christ endured justice. We have peace of God and with God because he had the sentence of the justice of God under God. Secondly, we see that it is a cleansing blood. It is Christ's blood first. Secondly, it is a cleansing blood. Look at the passage. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. It is a cleansing blood, cleansing, purging. This captures both justification, which is the theological word that speaks about a sinner being made acceptable in God's sight through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in atoning for their sins upon his cross and in crediting to their account his own perfect record of righteousness. But it also refers to sanctification, the ongoing purification that the Lord is bringing about. The Lord, for the Christian who is Brought into union with Christ by faith, justified before him. There's an ongoing work in which we die to sin and live unto righteousness. This is a blood that cleanses us. 1 Corinthians 6, we have stacked on one side a mountain of iniquity. And we have set before us on the other side a greater mountain of grace in the cleansing blood of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11. He just got done reviewing the catalog of their heinous sins. And he says in verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of your God. In Revelation chapter 1, the Christian is told he has loved you and washed you from your sins in his own blood. In Ephesians 1 verse 5, we're told in verses uh, 5, 6, and 7, look at verse 7, having predestined us, it says in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The Lord cleanses us from guilt. Not that feeling of guiltiness, but the object of record. We've broken the law of God and are indeed declared guilty before him. We're cleansed from that guilt. There's no other blood. The blood of martyrs can't cleanse you. The blood of dead saints can't cleanse you. No other creature under heaven can cleanse you. There is only one, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself cleansing you from the guilt of sin as well as the filth of sin, washing it away. We have expiation, the atoning work of Christ to take away our guilt. We have propitiation in which he he satisfies the wrath of the Father, drinking it up to its dregs, pacifying and appeasing the wrath of God against his people. Having said all of that, and it is wonderful, he does not cleanse everyone. He does not cleanse everyone. Not all are cleansed. He cleanses his believing people. He cleanses those who come to him by way of the gospel. He cleanses those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have a cabinet full of medicine. You can have a pharmacy full of medicine. You can have a warehouse full of medicine. The door is open, gigantic billboards on the outside. 
which speak of the healing power of these medicines. And people can walk by all day long and read it and hear of it and pass by. Gospel can be preached. And there are people who hear it with this ear, the ones attached to the side of our heads, but who don't believe the gospel, who do not believe the word that has been said. And just as those who hear about the medicine, but never benefit from it until they take it into their mouth, we can hear about the blood of Jesus and hear about the gospel of Jesus, but until we receive that good news by faith, It does not profit us. And so it comes as a cleansing agent to God's people. It's interesting. The word here is is actually in the present tense. It doesn't say cleansed long ago. It doesn't say will cleanse you someday. But it says is cleansing you. Cleanseth us from all sins. It's a continued action. It was done in the past. It is in the present. It will continue to be done into uh, the future. His blood was shed once, but it is applied often. One time, one sacrifice, offered once for all, never repeated. The sacrifice of Christ is not repeated in the Lord's Supper or in any other superstitious idolatrous ordinance. It happened one time in history, shed once, but it is applied often. We continue to receive the benefits of this cleansing blood. Just as we continue to sin, we continue to be cleansed from that sin. We are acceptable before God. A once for all definitive action cannot be repeated, cannot be undone, cannot be unwound. So likewise, his ongoing work in our soul is persistent invincible and notice that he cleanseth us from all sin how can so much be said in so few letters in english three letters the word all it's a small word but it is all encompassing it is comprehensive you know people will speak about something some treatment, some substance being a panacea. There's one panacea in the entire universe, and it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one true panacea, one universal remedy, only one universal remedy, and it is able to address every kind of sin. And so there is no guilt is too high, no stain is is too deep, There is infinite virtue in Christ's blood. And so the the small sins, as well as the extremely heinous sins, the past sins which plague us, as well as sins that we have not yet committed in the future. It can be sins in which we're engaged in oversight, sins of omission, where we fail to do things that we ought to do, and sins of commission, things that we do against what God has required of us. And we can't, we can't even begin. The Bible says we can't number the hairs on our head, and if we could, they would be inadequate to be a parallel to us numbering our sins. It would be literally and physically impossible for us to number all of our sins. Sins are not just when you gossip one time, or say a mean word another, or have an unchaste thought, or have a flare-up of your temper, or neglect private prayer, or desecrate the Sabbath. It's far more encompassing than that. There are subtleties to sin, which you are never conscious of. There are sins which you cannot trace out with your finger or your mind. There's a multitude of sin in your motivations, and in your ambitions, and in your attitudes, and in all that attends, so that the most holy exercise in the most holy acts of worship, have traces of sin in them. We have never been at our best worshiping God with the greatest faith and humility and fear and joy and love according to his prescription and in every other manner as closely as possible in a way that would glorify him without us dragging sin into it. 
and left to ourselves polluting it. There's a depth of sin that no mere man can plummet. And yet the Lord comes and he says, his blood cleanseth us from comprehensively from all sin. Every little trace, every nuance, every scent, every smell of sin is removed from us. It's true of all of the Old Testament believers, true of all of the believers that will live prior to Christ's second coming. Why is it that this blood is so great? Well, it is because his person is so great. It is only because the God-man has undertaken to save us from sin that any single individual can be saved from all of their sin, much less all of the elect from all of their sin. Oceans which have depths that leave man dazzled. There are mysteries in the depths of the oceans that scientists have not yet even begun to pull the cover off of. And yet, my friends, all of the oceans combined and multiplied, oceans of blood would be inadequate to cleanse a single sinner. And this blood is able. And it is blood that must be not only shed, but applied. The shedding of the blood was followed by the sprinkling of the blood. There's the Old Testament saint. You can picture him in your mind. He's he's prepared himself over days to come to the Lord in this ordinance on a sacrificial occasion. And he's he's selected and raised and nurtured uh, this goat or lamb. He brings it with him. He appears finally, it's his turn, before the priest. And the priest calls upon him to put his hand upon the head of this animal, to place his hand upon the beast. And the Old Testament believer realizes, I am being identified with this beast. This beast is standing in my place, if you will. And my sins are being transferred to the head of this animal. And it will pay the price that I owe. And then with his hand on the animal, the animal would be slit. And blood would pour out. And its last breath would be gasped. And it would die. And all of the blood would be drained out and gathered and collected. And then the blood would be placed upon that Old Testament believer, applied. It is necessary that contact with the blood be had. And so it is with us. It's not good enough for me as a minister of the gospel to come and preach and set forth before you and tell you and urge you and and seek to explain to you all that is involved in the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. You must have it applied to your defiled conscience And your heart. You must have it spiritually sprinkled upon your soul. And you must be discontent with any sort of spurious healing. Where people say they will heal the wounds of God's people slightly. Where people will steer off into this thing. Well, if I go to church enough, maybe that will you know, give me credit and God will find me. So if I read my Bible and if I do this or if I do that, I'll find healing and cleansing and forgiveness. Away with that rubbish. You have to come and fall on your face before the Son of God and plead his merits and say, my only hope is in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in standing in my place as my substitute, bearing my guilt, paying my punishment and forgiving my sins and thereby being cleansed from condemnation and punishment now in order that we might be rid of sin forever, even in the traces of its presence, finally on the last day. How is it that his blood cleanses? 
Christ was taking the sins of his people on himself. The Bible says he was made sin, not made sinful, not made sinner, but he was so identified with sin that he could bear the brunt of its consequences. The fact is that for every single one of us this morning, sin either remains with us, on us, in us, or our sin is placed on him. Nowhere else, nothing in between, nothing outside, above or below. Either your sin is on you, and you carry it in your own arms to the judgment seat, or your sin is on Christ, and he carries it in his arms to the judgment seat to plead your mercy. The sins of God's people were imputed to him, credited to him, were brought into union with him by faith, through faith. The Lord probes us and purges us. He strips us naked and clothes us with his own righteousness. And so for those of you who are distressed in conscience, the Lord comes to quiet you with reminders of the shedding of his blood. It is by his stripes that we are healed. It is by his stripes that we are healed. What that means is if that you find yourself this morning sitting under the preaching of God's word, hearing the voice of God through the Holy Scriptures, if you find yourself listening to the preciousness of the blood of Christ and yet have no interest in Christ's blood, It means that you are hopeless in your present state of any freedom from any of your guilt. Realize you're self-consciously saying, I'll have sin while spurning the Savior. And therefore you are locked down under the invincible power of of the law of God. And rather than rather than having liberty under that law, you are in bondage. Like a millstone hung around your neck, it will sink you into the depth of hell. It is a law that is not your friend. It is a law that testifies against you. And you are locked under its power and you're exposed rather than being hidden under shielded, under the arm of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're left exposed. And if the wrath of God comes down, you're not safe. You're exposed to that wrath when it comes without mercy. And you have no righteousness to offer, and you have no sacrifice to plead. And God will not cease being God on your behalf. He will be God forever still. And he will not be robbed of his glory His glory will be manifest and vindicated even at the cost of your own punishment. But what sweet peace and consolation there is for those who have by faith run for refuge under the arm of Christ himself. We are accepted. We're told in Romans that we're justified by his blood. We can appear in prayer before the Lord and say, Lord, receive me and hear me. Give me audience. Give me affection. Give me a warm reception. Because look, look at me. We can plead that God the Father would look upon us and to see that from head to toe we're covered, sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. We appear before his throne and we are recognizable by the blood that has been applied to us. And we can say, Lord, we are accepted. We have the garments of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been sacrificed for us. And therefore, though we are sinners still, and though we have many imperfections, and we have many things that afflict us, our comfort is well grounded because it's grounded in who Christ is, and it's grounded in what Christ has done. And we can say, Lord, all of my sin, all of it, You have promised to cleanse with the blood of Jesus and so cleanse it still 
this morning. The Bible says that the Lord provides for us a great cauldron open and flowing with the the blood of the Lord Jesus. And there is no sin that you can find within you, no backsliding that is without immediate remedy at this source. Every sin finds its remedy in the Lord Jesus. So especially as we think about the Lord's Supper, remember those words of Jesus himself when he says, and this is going back to where we began, bringing together the blood and communion or fellowship with God. He says in Matthew 26, verse 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Words uttered in the very act of communion with the Christ at his table. Christian, there is joy today. There is a feast today. There is communion with God today by his blood. And the Lord has marked it. And the Lord has beckoned and called us. And the Lord bids us welcome to enjoy the sweetness of fellowship with him in his blood. Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ. This, my friends, is a cleansing blood. And as we reflect upon Christ crucified again in this gospel of free grace, may the Lord uh, be pleased to bring down blessing upon us as we feed upon him. As we prepare now to come to the Lord's Supper, let me direct your attention, first of all, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. This portion of God's word lays out for us both the warrant for the supper as well as an explanation of the nature of the supper. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. The rest will I set in order when I come. Absolutely everything that we do in the public worship of God is done because God himself has commanded it. He's appointed it. And so it is here in the supper The Apostle Paul wants to make sure the Corinthians are aware of this. He says, listen, I have received of the Lord that which I also have delivered to you. The Lord appointed it. The Lord prescribed it. The source of this supper is found in Christ himself. And so he has has given it to us as an ordinance of worship. And it is to be be remembered. It is to be uh, celebrated. It is to be administered. For as long as he tarries, 
until his second return. There's no other expiration. It is only when we are hastened into the new heavens where we will enjoy not sitting down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God and chiefly supping with Jesus himself that these signs will be set aside. So what, what is the Lord's Supper? Well, the outward part is relatively obvious. We, we have bread set down below this pulpit. Common bread. Physical bread. And we know that we, we have this as the staple of our living. The whole world round, people eat bread as a staple to nourish them and to impart strength and uh, to satisfy hunger and so on. We also have wine, another staple used throughout the whole world, uh, which refreshes and makes glad the heart of men and nourishes uh, the sons of men, a tonic for us. And so the outward things are obvious. And what what do these signify? The bread, which is taken up and broken, signifies... Christ's body, which is broken upon the cross for his people. Blood, the wine which is poured out, signifies the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of his people. And this corresponds what is obvious external and what is uh, in its reality, the thing signified internally, corresponds to what we do in the supper. You have bread which is past. And it is offered and received. It is taken and eaten. Jesus in John 6 says that we feed upon Christ by faith. And these outward actions reflect an inward reality. The Christian is taking Christ, receiving him by faith and feeding upon him uh, by, by faith, drinking him by faith. And so we have bread that is in our our mouth that we can chew, but simultaneously we have Christ in the heart. And so we're remembering Christ crucified in the supper, but we're not merely remembering an event that took place in the past. There is a present engagement. There There is current communion and fellowship that is being had with Christ. We are communing with him who himself is present in the supper. So that in the exercise of faith, we are receiving Christ. We're feeding upon Christ. We're being nourished by Christ. All of the benefits of Christ are being poured out into our souls. Our faith is being strengthened.
but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The Bible lays out clear lines of demarcation. And the Lord says, there's a divine fence around the sacraments. There are many ways in which the word and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are similar. They communicate the same grace. They bring the same message. There's many things. But there are many, many ways in which they're dissimilar. Whereas the word of God is to be preached to every creature under heaven, the supper is reserved only for his people. And so the Lord draws lines and he says, look, there are those who are citizens of my kingdom and those who are citizens of the kingdom of, of darkness. There are those who are children in my house and those who are strangers from my house. There are those who are members of my body, those not members of my body, citizens of my kingdom, not citizens of my kingdom. The Lord draws lines and he says the Lord's Supper is reserved for those who professed faith in the Lord Jesus, been baptized, uh, entrance into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, membership within the visible church, love for his church, love for its head, the Lord Jesus, attachment and devotion and, and uh, a commitment uh, to his cause and to his ordinances that he has, has given. And so there's, there are um, specifications. And there may be some here this morning who have professed faith in the Lord Jesus no one else knows, but you know that you're at peace with sin and not at peace with God. And that there may be secret, scandalous, unrepentant sins, sins you're not willing to let go, sins you're holding on to. Well, in the name of God, I warn you. I warn you not to meddle with the Almighty in such things. It's the practice of our church that uh, those who are visiting with us uh, are asked, required to meet with the session uh, prior to being admitted to the table, not because we don't let visitors come. We, we do. We delight to have them uh, join us, uh, those who are members in good standing of other uh, Bible-believing churches. But we want to ensure that uh, we have a responsibility uh, to the Lord as well as to the souls of those who uh, come uh, into our, our assembly and fellowship, and we want to ensure that they understand uh, the things that we're discussing about the gospel and their standing with Christ and, and so on. But notice that, and this is a, a recurring theme for me, which frankly you'll never hear me stop singing, and that is this, while the Lord says, offers warning with regards to coming before him at his, his table, he also offers assurance. So there are those who look at the foreboding threat that comes with the covenant of grace and who are unduly hindered. Their hearts are made to tremble. They're, they, 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 unwarranted as it may be, are unwilling, are unable uh, to come to the table. And we're to, be remember, we're, to, we're to be reminded that the table is not for Christians that have reached some special place of achievement, holiness, righteousness before the Lord. The Lord is not coming to fill the mouth of those who are full. He's coming to fill the mouth of those who are empty and weak. And so the Lord, he can say to Corinth, look, your history is not happy. You have great provocations that in your past life you raised before the Lord. But ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified. The question is, do we appear before the Lord in all of our defilement and difficulty and struggle and <clears throat> fears and troubles with the blood of Christ on us? That's what matters. Have we been sprinkled? Have we come by faith to Christ? As redeemed sinners, the Lord welcomes us, urges us, and seeks to refresh us with fresh sights of his love. Let's turn then to the supper itself. I'm going to ask you to take your psalters and turn with me to Psalm 118. 
Psalm 118, verses 17 to 23, so portion will sing. The tune is Jackson, which is number 78. Tune number 78. Psalm 118, verse 17. So as we sing the, these four stanzas, we sing this section, if those who uh, are coming to the supper, if the communicants would make their way forward while we sing, and find uh, a seat at uh, the table. So we invite you to, to come uh, while we're singing. So our presenter will lead us in Psalm 118, verses 17 to 23. Lord. table. This is indeed the Lord's table, and he himself is the chief guest with whom we have come to meet. And let me give you a couple of his words uh, to you as you gather together under his hand. In the Song of Songs, chapter 2, and verse 3, we read these words. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 3, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Notice that the Christian thinks of the Lord Jesus in a singular fashion. He is chief. He is, as the passage says, the apple tree among the trees of the wood, the fruitful one in whom our hearts find refuge. But I would especially draw to your attention the, the imagery here of sitting down. Passage says, I sat down under his shadow. And it's especially helpful because we come to the Lord's table and sit down. And we are sitting down under his shadow. And there's lots that's conveyed in that, I think. There's a, there's a sense of weariness. You, you run, or you walk, or you work for a long time, and then you sit down to rest. And we're laboring away in the Christian vineyard, in the service of the Lord, and in battle at war with sin and the devil and everything else that's happening. 
and there's much that is arduous and much that is taxing and much that, that depletes our strength. And the Lord invites us this morning and says, sit down. Sit down under my shadow. We're tempted. We're troubled. Some of us are pining. And the Lord says, sit down. He doesn't call us to stand, doesn't call us to run, but even in spiritual exhaustion, there is no other place, no other seat that can be found for rest than that which is found in Christ. Here is our real rest. Here is our rest, sitting under his own shadow. And notice that it's under his shadow. It's a place of relief. What does a shadow do for you? You're standing in the sun. Your eyes are squinting and becoming tired. Beads of sweat have soaked you. You're, you're feeling the way in which heat almost pulls strength out of your body. The Lord says you're coming under the shadow. Here it's cool. Here there's, there's relief. There's rest from the scorching heat of our Christian pilgrimage. Here we find Christ's satisfaction of his law and of God's justice. Here we find a shield, a covering that protects us from his wrath. Here we have a place to make sense of our uneasiness with self. We can find ourselves settled in him. And so he invites us to lodge here, to sit down under his shadow, to take our abode here. And he says, all who come to me by, will by no means be, be cast out. The world does what for us? In the midst of this pilgrimage through the desert, through the wilderness, it keeps setting forth one mirage after another. And you think, there, there it is. There's some, there's some relief. There's some satisfaction. We run to it, and as we get to it, it dissipates. It's gone. It vanishes. And then we run to the next mirage, and it too disappears before us. The Lord says, not so here. Here you find the sum and substance of his blessing and of his grace because it is found at his own hand. So may the Lord strengthen us, help us to sit down, not just physically at his table, but to sit down really and truly to find our rest under the shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let's look to the Lord for prayer. Our Lord and our God, we bow down our hearts before you this day and confess that you are a God of all grace, that you are more full of grace than we are full of sin, that you are a God who pities us and rather than driving us as a harsh master, provides in order to relieve us of our burdens, in order to quicken enliven us in your, your grace. Truly, our Savior is the apple tree for us. And so we have come to him this day. And we pray that you would grant unto us uh, great spiritual transactions with heaven. May we truly feast upon Christ in his grace and abound in the fullness and fatness of your provision. We ask, O oh Lord, that just as surely as we thank you for this ordinance, we ask you to add your benediction and blessing to it, that the common bread and common wine uh, would be set apart for these holy purposes, and that you would be pleased to work within the souls of your people for good. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, having taken bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Our Savior also took the cup after supper and having given thanks as we've done in his name, he gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it.
Let's look to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Graciously, our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have set a table for us, even in the midst of our enemies, and that you have anointed our heads with oil. And we are thankful that you have been pleased to never leave us and to never forsake us. We're thankful that you have shown mercy not only in its inception when first coming to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, but that has risen to a mountain before our eyes as we have seen you continue to shower mercy after mercy after mercy upon us. And we rejoice this day that you have once again seen fit to draw us nigh and to bless us. And we pray that we would go forth in that strength, desiring afresh to glorify you with all of our being, and to serve you with all of the resources that we can muster, and that it would be under your hand a source that might spread your fame throughout the world, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Allow me to just briefly uh, direct your attention back <coughs> to the portion we were looking at a few moments ago, Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 3. It goes on, it says, I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet uh, to my taste. Notice especially these words, with great delight, and his fruit was sweet uh, to my taste. There is a fullness for the soul. It's one thing to, in interacting with another individual, receive a kindness as a matter of routine. It's another thing to receive it and to feel it and to respond to it and to be blessed by it. The Lord's people were, were coming, it's, there's a delight, there's a, as the text says, a great delight in receiving from his hand because the Lord is, he's not happy with us merely eking our way along, following like two children, you know, a, a trail of crumbs. But like a good father, he wants us full. He wants us strong. He wants us happy and blessed in him. And that fullness of the soul is seen in the increase of, of grace in the, and in the application of the cleansing blood that we spoke of. His fruit was sweet to my taste. This is the benefits of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would have us weaned from the world's food. To think of that as bitter fare, the bitterness of sin and instead to have us living day by day upon the provision that he has given to us as both delicious, that which is sweet to our taste, and as being nutritious, being what imparts health uh, to, to our souls. The end result is what? The end result is energy, the end result is strength, the end result is the ability to work, the end result is physically eating, produces within us vitamins and increased immune system and, and uh, our hormones operating properly and physical vigor and protein for our muscles and so on. So when the Lord comes and he says, I'm going to delight you and I'm going to make sweet to your taste the fruit that I am giving to you, it is with the aim of spurring us forward in the pursuit of holiness. If you only take in food and never use that in exercise, you become unhealthy, not strong. And so with the Lord, he comes and he feeds us at his table. It is to be put to use in our pursuits of devotion and service and obedience and pursuit of his glory. Our response of gratitude and love is shaped by that pursuit of godly piety. So may the Lord help us then uh, to bring forth this fruit to his own glory. 
We'll now return to our seats while singing from Psalm 118. And we'll sing the next section, the last four stanzas of the psalm. Verses 24 to 29, same tune, the tune Jackson. Psalm 118, verses 24 to 29. And as we sing, you can make your way back to your seats. Verses 17 to 19. Tune is Effingham number 56. Psalm 72, verses 17 to 19. For the benediction. 
Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.